Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second installment in the 2020-21 uh, Faith and Life Lecture Series. This is the 18th season of the series. A special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. Welcome to you. I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, the Senior Pastor of St. Philip Deacon, which is privileged to offer this uh, lecture series as a community service, and we're delighted that you're spending your evening with us. For those of you who are not familiar with the series, for the last 18 years, what we've done is brought in uh, experts in all kinds of fields who happen to be Christian and are willing to talk about how their Christian faith informs whatever it is that they do. So we have had journalists, we've had lawyers, we've had doctors, we've had counselors, we've had nonprofit leaders, uh, we've had scientists, we've had historians, we've had athletes, and probably a lot of other categories of people I'm forgetting. Uh, tonight, we are delighted to uh, present uh, a business leader, someone who has spent his career in banking and investment banking, and most recently in his career, he has led the turnaround of not one but two made in USA companies, and he'll be speaking about that tonight. Um, I always like to say something a little off the beaten path to introduce our speakers, so I actually want to lift, lift up a few things tonight that make our speaker distinctive compared to other speakers we we've had. Uh, the first is that uh, he is a local gentleman. He was uh, born and raised here in the Twin Cities, went to Edina West, where he graduated from. Um, most of our speakers, believe it or not, have been outside of the Twin Cities from around the country and indeed around the world, so the fact that he's local uh, differentiates him from other speakers we've had. Uh, the second is that he is a Lutheran. Uh, now, despite the fact that we are presenting this from a Lutheran church, most of the speakers in this series have actually come from other Christian traditions. We've had very few Lutheran speakers, and so that distinguishes him. And the third thing, and I don't know offhand if we have had anyone else uh, speak for us who also had this hobby, but it turns out our, our speaker tonight is also an amateur trumpet player. Maybe he will say a few words about that. We are <laughs> delighted to welcome him. Will you help join me or join me in welcoming Paul Grangard? Thank you, Tim. I'm going to go off script just for a second at the beginning here uh, and acknowledge the heavy night we have tonight. If ever there were a night at least in my lifetime, for faith, hope, and prayer, it's tonight. And I feel funny being, what you'll see in a moment, lighthearted the way I am, generally, on a night like tonight. But we need to get our lives back. We need to get our country back. So I'm going to be lighthearted because I, I've learned the hard way that when I try to be something I think I should be, but it's not who I really am. Like in a leadership position, it doesn't go very well. So it's a night for prayer, especially for Packer fans. I want to say that. Now, secondly, Tim, I'm honored that you would ask me to be here tonight, but I am really a little bit disturbed by the fact that you've asked me to violate one of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments that were brought down by Moses Nielsen from Mount Trollhagen, and they were written for Scandinavian descent Lutherans in Minnesota. And the biggest one, the most important one, is you never talk about your faith in public. So here I am violating one of those Ten Commandments. I remember when, uh, in the 80s, when the Lutheran Church in America, which was heavy on Swedes, merged with the American Lutheran Church, heavy on Norwegians, and they put it together. They moved it to Chicago, the headquarters, so that we'd have a neutral location because they didn't want the Swedes and the Norwegians upset that the other guys got the headquarters, right? Isn't that what happened? Yeah, so, and they had to come up with a new name, and I was a lot younger than didn't know anything about branding, and I thought, well, that's easy. You go to the American Lutheran Church in America. But they decided instead to call it the Evangelical Lutheran Church, which in, in the context of what I just said earlier, I thought at that young age, how ridiculous is that? I mean, talk about not understanding your audience. I've finished going door-to-door -door selling Little League booster buttons, and now you want me to go door-to-door -door as an evangelical. Well, it turns out evangelical has a different definition, which is steeped in the gospel. And uh, that's what our tradition is, steeped in the gospel. So I'm going to get through this first slide. This has been making me nervous for about three weeks. And then I'm going to turn to 
things that I know much more about. But faith for me is something that I learned before I really knew I was learning anything. My parents were very devout. We went to church every Sunday. So when they say your personality is set by the time you're five or six, I had been to a lot of years of Sunday school already when uh, my personality was, was set. We went to a church called Good Shepherd. So I think that's an important thing to remember. Good Shepherd is the image that I grew up with. Uh, Christ as a shepherd, not as King of Kings, Lord of Lords. That actually comes out of the Old Testament anyway. So we were focused on the Gospels. You know, and you might say, well, focused on the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, of course, it was a Christian church. Well, it's actually, it's, it's not that, it's, that's not a weak statement. Because as we all know, you can quote almost anything out of a part of the Bible and justify being angry, hating, whatever. There are things that have been turned around in the Bible, but it's hard to do that out of a focus on the gospel. And as I'll talk about in a second, the one thing we never focused on is the idea of an apocalypse. This was a faith about hope and charity and love, not one about the world's going to end. And imagine if you're a Lutheran out there watching this, the last time you heard somebody stand up at a lectern and say, a reading from the book of Revelation. It's probably never happened. We had one about three years ago, but... Uh, I still think the four horsemen played for Notre Dame. So these are the key tenets of my, of my faith growing up, in addition to the overriding Christian view. First, the priesthood of all believers. There's an equality to the faith I grew up in. We're all able to be priests. That was new and different in the Protestant faiths, and particularly in Lutheranism. It's something that Luther said not only are we all able to be priests, which means we can have our own relationship with God directly, dialogue directly with God, we're also all saints. We just celebrated All Saints Sunday, and it's a very moving day in our church. We put a rose on the altar for every member who passed away ahead of us. And, and that was very moving when it was my parents at two different times, far apart, actually. Um, to have that rose placed there. These are saints, but we're also all sinners, which I think is an important thing to remember. Saints can be sinners, and sinners can be saints, and that'll, that'll come into my uh, leadership beliefs here in a moment. It's a very ecumenical faith. As I tried to say, we don't push ourselves at others. We're very accepting and tolerant. We were one of the first faiths to ordain women as ministers, and one of the first women who were ordained, who was ordained with the group at the very beginning ended up being at our church when I was in junior high and high school. So uh, it's, a, it's a progressive faith, I would say, to use a small p. Um, probably picked the wrong word there this evening. But um, the second thing is we're saved by grace alone. Works don't matter. We are given the chance for, for salvation for the forgiveness of our sins just on the fact that we believe. So we, we're saved by grace alone. And I'm a huge believer that God is still talking to us. And there are a lot of things that people have said to me, song lyrics that I have heard. By the way, music is a huge part of our faith tradition, and, and uh, so is art. So that'll come in here in a minute. But um, things that I've heard over the years that I remember because I think they come from a higher place. So my uh, mentor and boss, David Crosby at Piper Jaffray, once explained to me, said the following thing. If you can afford to be gracious, you should be. And if I'm saved by grace, I think as a leader, I should try to be gracious. So that's a, a second thing here. Another big thing is this idea of vocation being a mission, that your work is a calling, even if you're not called as a priest. I remember a quote that I couldn't find on the internet that I think Luther did say, which is, the staff that cleans the church serves the Lord as well as the priest at the altar if they do a good job. I was able to find on the internet a quote that's very similar, which is, the shoemaker doesn't serve the Lord by making shoes with little crosses on them. He serves the Lord by making good shoes 
because the Lord is interested in good craftsmanship. So I guess I was meant, since I went to this church from the smallest age, to be a shoemaker at some point in my life. Another thing in our church and our tradition, but this is also more out of the Old Testament and the prophets, is this idea of calling reluctant leaders. And uh, a friend of mine once had to tell me at the end of a really poor performance as a leader, at the very beginning of my tenure as head of investment banking at Piper Jaffray, Paul, you got the job, you got to take it. I thought about that for about a year and a half. It took me about a year and a half to get in the swing of things. I'll talk about that in a minute. The fifth thing I want to talk about is this idea of the parable of the tenants. You sit in church and, and you hear a lot of stories. And the first minister when I was young at this church was, was a bit of a fire and brimstone guy. He was not all that cuddly. And I think we're in danger of the faith getting off course these days when we think of Jesus mostly as our secret friend. Because a lot of people don't feel they need a secret friend. And I always felt that in my faith, yes, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, was an important part of the faith. But this challenge was an important part of the faith, to, to live a life of service and to live a life of meaning. And this parable of the tenants, which I list here, talents, I mean, talents, uh, is, uh, is something that I think just was ingrained in me. And it's a weird parable. The master gives three slaves talents. Two slaves get five talents. One slave gets one. And if I were a biblical scholar, I would want to talk about why the poor guy only got one. The two with five go out and make something with their talents and return when the master comes back his money twofold or more. The one who got one buried the talent because he feared his master. And he was afraid if he lost it, his master would uh, kill him. Well, it turns out his master sent him out in the wilderness where there would be gnashing of teeth. That's one of the places in the Bible where that phrase comes from. I'm not sure exactly what you do when you gnash your teeth, but it doesn't sound like a good thing. He goes out to gnash his teeth. The other five are told, another phrase that's very famous, well done, good and faithful servant. So I take that to mean God wants us to do stuff. Back to the idea that people are always telling, uh, saying things that I think come from a higher place. The best high school speech I ever heard, I was on the school board for two terms and then four kids graduated after that. So I was at 10 different high school graduations and many of them were really impressive. But they weren't that memorable because they were so much alike and so much what you would expect to hear at a high school graduation. And this saint, if you want to call him that, good friend of my youngest son, Seaver Johansson, got up and he said, do stuff. Don't sit around playing video games. Do stuff. I thought, that's, that's a good motto. That's a really good motto. And then I was at a St. Olaf board meeting recently, and uh, one of the uh, board members said, you know, we were talking about what the Lutheran faith means. And she said, isn't it about repent and reform? And I hadn't heard that until three weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, and I thought, you know, what a great way to think about a business turnaround. Repent and reform. And a lot of companies that don't get turned around don't get turned around because they either don't repent the mistakes they're making or they can't reform. And at these two companies that we'll talk about in a minute, we have repented and we've also reformed. And then the last thing is the book of Gretzky, which I'll explain why I have that here in a minute. Okay. If you're going to be a servant leader, you have to ask one of the most fundamental questions of all is, whom do you serve? It's like Herb Brooks in the movie Miracle. Who do you play for? Who do you play for? And Bill George, a great CEO in this town, and we've been really lucky in this town to have a lot of great servant leaders running the companies here. And Bill George wrote a book called uh, True North, and in it he describes 
five key constituencies for a business. Shareholders, customers, employees, suppliers, and community. And starting in the late 80s, and I witnessed this in uh, my own business career, the whole focus started to go on you serve shareholders. In fact, the boards were told through cases, legal cases and other types of pressures that the key constituency was serving shareholders. And in an odd way, that was called your fiduciary duty coming from the Latin word for faith. Fiduciary duty to put shareholders first. Well, what happens if you put shareholders first? Now, what we're talking about here is emphasis, and we're talking about which direction you look through the work looking glass. So you put shareholders first, your big concern is share price, which means your big concern is the bottom line. Businesses grow through the top line. As a friend of mine, my colleague Ross Woodmar will say, a growing top line covers a lot, a lot of mistakes at the bottom line. But if you're so focused on the bottom, um, you end up making judgments that you maybe wouldn't w make. So one of the things that I heard an awful lot about when I was in the investments business and cust uh, company CEOs would come and present their story, their investment story to try to get people interested in their stock was we're gonna be a low cost producer. We're a low cost producer. And I would hear that time and time again and I thought, boy, this is gonna be a race to the bottom. Because all these companies, I was covering the food industry at the time, all these food industry companies want to be low-cost producers. They can't all be the low-cost producer. And it led to an efficiency obsession. Your customers don't care about your efficiencies. What they care about is the quality of the product that you make. That also led then to rampant offshoring. These numbers are going to shock you. We've all learned in the last six months that the majority of our medicines are made in China. Less than 3% of the shoes that are bought in the United States in a given year were made in the United States. Less than 3% of the apparel that's bought in the United States were made in the United States. So if we ever really did get into a major conflict with China, we'd all be walking around with no clothes, no shoes, and high blood pressure. Uh, high uh, cholesterol, too, probably. That created China as a global superpower. The bet was that they would join the League of Nations. The idea of, of peaceful world globalization, good for everybody. It hasn't quite turned out that way, but more what it did was it destroyed the middle class in a number of states, particularly in the Southeast, as we lost all these manufacturing jobs. We have a pandemic of bad customer service, not just in this country, it's, it's in other places as well. By the way, the Europeans helped China a lot in this, this uh, <coughs> taking the middle class away from the country where they had been in these manufacturing jobs. We need manufacturing jobs in this country if we're gonna have a strong middle class. So, pandemic of bad customer service, the famous commercial you remember from TV where you end up with somebody in a foreign country whose name is Peggy but doesn't really speak English very well. We've all had these experiences waiting on phone calls for a long time. Why is that? Well, there are two reasons. One is the employees are treated in a way many times where they don't really want or care about customers. They just assume not interact, and a second thing is this efficiency idea. In many cases, these customer service areas have been pushed so far away from the business that they serve that they don't really know the business that well and don't have a feeling of connection to it. This is one of my favorites, the cult of best practices. And I think it's really important for a business to focus on the market and understand what the competitors are doing and how they're doing it. But back to this idea of the book of Gretzky, those of you, you know, it's another religion here in this state, hockey. Wayne Gretzky famously said, what, when asked why he scored more, more goals than anybody, anybody else in NHL history, he said, some people skate to where the puck is, 
I skate to where the puck is going. And if you're so focused on your competitors or other people's best practices, that's where the puck is. It might even be where the puck has been. You want to skate to where the puck is going, you got to use your talents. You got to get them out of the ground, use your talents, and be creative, innovate. Another thing that focusing on efficiency has done to businesses, it's made businesses think from the company outward. This is how we do things here. We're trying to do this more efficiently this year than last year, and that's how we do things, as opposed to thinking from the customer backward into the company, which is something we're working on a lot, and I'll talk about in a minute at Faribault Wool and Mill. The last thing I think that this obsession with shareholders created was that the representative of the company to those shareholders, the CEO, became even more imperial than is sort of naturally the case. So when I, I think about my faith compared to some of these shortcomings of focusing on shareholders, by the way, shareholders, I learned in a, a lesson taking companies public in my early career. We worked really hard taking a company public to get a, a bid for the stock before the stock started to trade from one of the great money managers in the country at the time. And we worked and we worked and the management called him several times, answered all his questions, and we were thrilled when he put in an order, a big order for the stock. Company goes public, by the end of the day, he'd already sold his position. And I remember thinking at that point, why would you put these people first? Your customers don't leave you within the same day. Your employees don't have the ability to just jump up and leave you all the time. So why put people who trade stock, trade your ownership like water during the day at the top? Now, it's capitalism. You have to provide a competitive return. But the point is, if you focus on the derivative, which is the people who derive the benefit from how well you do with customers' employees, instead of on the original place, customers' employees, for where you're going to put your focus that drives the benefit to the shareholders, you're going to, you're going to be making a lot of mistakes, I think. So the imperial CEO. What is an imperial CEO? Oop, there we go. Now you're looking at this picture and you're thinking, uh, I know what that is, it's a picture of Jesus. Well, I had the great privilege in 1979 to spend a quarter in Florence, Italy. It completely changed my life. And in terms of faith development and faith knowledge, it was like a Sunday school extension course on steroids. Everywhere you go, you're seeing things that were built to the glory of God. You're seeing artwork that's um, telling the stories for illiterate people so that they can learn the Bible through, through paintings and pictures. And this is the ceiling of the baptistry in Florence. And you have to think about the baptistry in Florence, Italy. Who was baptized in there? Who else? Who knew this mosaic that we see here in front of us? Galileo? Michelangelo, Giotto, Donatello, all these incredible people of the Renaissance were very familiar with this mosaic. So what's going on in this mosaic? It's not just a picture of Jesus. It describes in great detail, and I learned this when I was in school there. We had a teacher from the Uffizi Museum, a curator from the Uffizi. I was on the edge of my chair because it wasn't just about art history. It was also trying to explain to me the history of this faith that I had grown up in and so many things that I didn't know. So you look at this picture of Jesus and you realize there's nothing human about him. Even though in the, the Gospels it says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He's not dwelling among us in this picture. It's two-dimensional. He looks like he's sitting on something, but he's actually not really sitting on something. The background behind him that's so gold that's to make it very clear to anybody who sees it that he is in the divine realm. 
the divine kingdom is all gold behind him. The heavy, heavy halo around his head with, is intended to indicate that this is not anything close to being the word ma being made flesh and dwelling among us. And the cross in his halo is actually to indicate Jesus, because you'll notice there are a number of other figures in this mosaic who also have heavy halos around their head. His glance looks a little bit like he's looking at us, but that's just because of the direction where the uh, camera was that took the picture. This is actually way up in the ceiling, and it slants away from you, so the glance is actually over your head, way behind you. There's no way f back to the priesthood of all believers. There's actually no way in, in and this was done in 12, uh, 1240s. There was no way for in, in the 13th century for you to interact directly with God. But the most important thing here, and why I say this is the imperial CEO, in addition to the fact that if you had to ask yourself who's the smartest guy in this mosaic, it's got to be this guy. He's way bigger than everybody else, right? But if you look at his hands, first of all, they don't look like human hands. Another way of separating God from us in this time in history and thought but uh, his right hand has the thumb up, and his left hand has the thumb down. So this is the last judgment. So you're about to be baptized into a faith, and what they show you is the end in Revelation when you are either going to heaven or you're going to hell. And the thumb down side, the left hand, if you look down below, you'll see there are demons grabbing people out of out of their uh, caskets. And if I could show you a little more, just to the right, there's a monster that has four bodies, half-eaten bodies coming out of its mouth. It's a total wonder that Christianity survived starting people off in the faith with a picture of the last judgment in a, in a baptistry. Baptistries usually had pictures of John the Baptist also in them, and, and up high in the ceiling in this Mosaic is the story of John the Baptist. But what do they show? Salome's dance, Herod asking Salome what he, she uh, wants for having done the dance. She says his head on a platter, so then you see John the Baptist's head on a platter. That's the kind of stuff that you're confronted with at this time. So why do I say this is not so weird to think about the imperial CEO of the 1980s? In the 1980s, it was very common to talk about driving efficiency into your business, getting unproductive people out of your company. Jack Welch was famous for at General Electric for the idea that you should fire one in 10, and if you had smaller than 10 people on your team, you still had to fire one every year, clean out the lower part. Left hand down, you're going to hell. What do you think that does to the culture of a team if one of you is not going to be there at the end of the year? What does that do to cooperation? What does that do to innovation? Are you going to be willing to take your five talents and try to see what you can do with them? Or are you going to bury one in the ground? So that kind of an environment created fear. Another famous CEO from that time wrote a book called Execution. And I read it. It's one of the last business books I ever read. Because I thought, I'm not sure whether he's talking about getting things done or whether he's talking about what they do to the employees when the name of the book is Execution. So this isn't who I wanted to be when I talk about how I got off to a really rough start. Like a lot of people, I think this idea of a judge, somebody who's making harsh judgments, tough businessman, that's a leader. I thought that's what I was supposed to be, and I had just been made uh, uh, the, the leader of all my really good friends. It was a very difficult time to, for me, and it took me quite a while to realize they don't want a boss. I don't want to be the boss. What I want to be is I want to help them do what they want to do, what they can do, because that, that room, which I'm about to show you, the investment banking team at Piper Jeffrey, was filled with people who were a lot smarter than I was. This is what I think leadership ought to be like. Another picture out of my faith that inspires that leadership, and this one is more familiar to you, I'm sure. This is Da Vinci's 
Last Supper, which is not in Florence, it's actually in Milan. But this looks like a managing director's meeting with David Crosby in the middle and my friends on other sides. But just to stick with the faith for a minute, what's going on here? The, uh, the, the man in the blue, just to our left, the third person to our left is Judas. He's holding in his hand, you can't really see it, a sack of blood money. He's also reaching for one of the rolls that Jesus has just blessed. And what has just happened is Jesus has told them all that he knows he's going to be betrayed that evening. And Judas is coiling away because he can't believe he's already been found out before it was even started. He's also, I read this on the internet today just as a little refresher, he's, uh, he's the lowest head in the group. So you've got all these other disciples there in groups of three talking to each other. What, what do you mean? Why is he saying this? And um, they're shocked. They're angry. Peter is just to the left of Judas. He's really unhappy because he doesn't think that this is possible. There's no way this could, could happen. The guy in the picture who I identify the most with is on the, the right. He's pointing his finger up in the air. <clears throat> and that's Thomas. Doubting Thomas. One of the best sermons I ever heard in church was by Pastor Deborah Samuelson in our church. And she made this point. Doubt is not an excuse for not trying to live a life of faith. We all have doubts. And I remember when I first heard the story of, or when I heard it, I don't know if it was the first time, it was probably the sixth time I heard it, but um, I thought, that's my guy. That's me. I would have to see. So the words in the Bible, you know, blessed, you, you believe because you have seen, blessed is the one who believes but has not seen. I still have that kind of trouble. Anyway, think about this then from a corporate leadership point of view. First of all, Jesus knows that he's going to have to sacrifice. And if you think leadership is all about fun and fame and fortune, you're wrong. It's tough. Only people who think leadership's easy are maybe the really talented people at it, like some really talented people think sports are easy because it comes so easily to them. But for most of us, it's tough. And sacrifice is a big part of it. But the other thing is just these people talking to each other. Even though the leader's in the room, they're not sitting there waiting to hear any more of what he has to say. They're already reacting. They're already talking about it. To me, a great organization is one with a round table at the top, and then everybody in the round table has their own round tables. So instead of an org chart that cascades down from the imperial CEO in boxes and layers, you actually have these interlocking tangential circles where everybody feels like they're a part of a team of equals, where it's possible to say what you really think and what you want to do. I once told a neighbor how we turned around as a team, Alan Edmonds, and I went through this litany of things, and I was feeling pretty good about it because we'd taken this company from bankrupt to very successful together. And he said, yeah, it's a lot of common sense, huh? It kind of burst my balloon a little bit, but actually he was right. It was a lot of common sense, but common sense requires a framework. If your framework is... We're here for the bottom line and for the shareholders, and that's your key priority. It's a different kind of common sense. So what are the common sense things in reform and repent that I think you need to do to turn a company around? Again, inspired by treat people the way they want to be treated and the way you want to be treated as number one. Usually when you have to turn around a company, the culture needs to change. It isn't just the business itself, it's the culture. And in many cases, there's already a cancer in the culture. Years of, of not doing well creates frustration, usually has led to arguments in the past between people who should work well together, so there's, there are grudges. You need a new culture. I call the beginning because I knew when I went over to run Allen Edmonds, having come from the private equity world, that people would be thinking, OK, is this another one of those turnaround guys? Jack the Ripper, Chainsaw Al, these are the names of turnaround specialists. 
So I wanted people to understand who I was and my humanity. Not my humanity just, but their humanity. Hello, humor, humanity. I walked past a woman once, and now I realize I'm getting way behind. So I walked past a, a woman once who worked right pa on my way to my desk every day at Allen Edmonds. And she was always there before me because I was often commuting in from Minneapolis, and I'd get there about 9, and she'd be there at 8. And I walked past her and say, hello, Sue. She'd say hello back. And after about three months, I, I said, Sue, how am I doing? I just, I didn't have a good feel. Are, are we, are the customers reacting very well to what we're doing with new products? And what Sue said just really struck me. She said, things are a lot better now that somebody says hello to me. Just the human touch of saying hello made her happy in her job, made her much prouder to work at that place. And I've heard that story from other people in other situations. Humor, I gotta use humor if I'm gonna be who I am. I said at my mother's funeral that we, we had a thing, my mom and me, my mom and I. We would uh, sit around and laugh at our jokes. She'd laugh at hers and I'd laugh at mine. So humor's important to me so it's not just establishing their humanity, it's also establishing your humanity. If you want to know about customers, who's the right person to ask? The people who interact with the customers. At both companies, I'd ask people, what do you think our customers would, would like? And in each case, they said, at both places, I, I can't believe you asked me. People don't usually ask me that. Well, this idea of the voice of the customer is what has come into the vernacular. It just seems to me to be a very natural way of doing what you think, how you'd like to be treated. You'd like to be a part of the team. You'd like your opinion to count. This idea of efficiency. When you're in a turnaround situation, as we were at Allen Edmonds at the beginning in 2008, we had to do a layoff. We were gonna lose over a million dollars if we didn't do a layoff, and we just didn't have that kind of capital. But once we did the layoff, we stopped talking about efficiency. We ta stopped talking about cost control. We let the purse strings a little loose because we knew that people were, were nervous and, and worried about their future. Is there another shoe that's about to drop? Pardon the pun, at a shoe company. At Faribault Woolen Mill, the layoff had already been done. I'm proud to say because of the success we've had in the last few weeks with the rest of the strategy, we've already gone beyond the employment of that layoff that they had done last year. Be friendly with your customers. We had a policy at Allen Edmonds, which was, if you've worn your shoes and scuffed up the bottom, we won't take them back from you as a customer. Why? Because we were afraid of getting scammed by people who might wear shoes for a wedding and then try to return them for full refund. So we had a very high quality customer base. Very few people would do that, but we had a policy that treated everybody as if they might do that. You imagine the number of people who thought they were gonna break in a pair of shoes, and then they would still hurt, who would wanna return them, and we said, no, you, you've worn them too much, we, we won't take them back. What a great way to lose a customer. We changed that policy to no questions asked, we'll take the uh, customer back. This next one is uh, the most important. I had on that page about the key tenants, walk humbly with God. I didn't know anything about how to make shoes. I'd been noticing shoes since my time in Italy. I, needed, I also didn't know anything about running a retail organization. I knew we needed to build our retail organization. So I had needed to hire people who knew these things. Now the shoe side we had in spades with the guys who were already there making the shoes. But on the go-to-market side, marketing and store management, I needed to hire some pros, and I did. My first hire was a former advertising guy from Leo Burnett, the advertising firm in Chicago that came up with Tony the Tiger and many other famous advertising campaigns. He was brilliant, really hardworking person. And then I hired a guy I had known from a charitable board who had been chief operating officer of Gander Mountain. He'd also been head of merchants, all the merchants at Dayton Hudson. He knew things about 
retailing that I never would have known. <coughs> and he came and brought that expertise to us and really launched us. All right, now I'm going to move a little faster. So the other thing you need besides a reformed culture is you need a vision. I like to say if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. You just don't know where you're going to end up. Vision is actually common sense, but it's much rarer than you might think. So we decided at Allen Emmons our vision was to be the great American shoe company. We wanted to go from a blue suit, black, black shoes world, which was fading away and no longer existing, no, it was just faded away. It wasn't no longer existing, but it was really fading away. We wanted to go from that to being a seven-day-a-week, all parts of the day shoe company. We wanted to be your loafer in the evening. We wanted to be your brown shoes, not just your black shoes. We then got into belts to match those shoes, way better than we had ever done before. We got into leather goods and apparel. We wanted to be a lifestyle brand. The vision was made in USA, very high quality. At Faribault Woolen Mill, we want to be a great blanket and throw company, and we want to expand from that to be a great company in natural fibers. So wool, cotton. I don't know if you know this, but that performance wear that you like so much is made out of petroleum products. It's why it smells after you've worn it once. Natural fibers are sustainable. They're better for the environment. And they're also higher quality stuff. All right. Taking a long time here. So let's get to the product side of it. What did we do to, to really drive the business forward and get out of the ditch? Number one is we reintroduced fan favorites. If you listen to your customers, they're angry at you because you have taken things away from them that they like. We added colors to those. One of the main things we did was we changed the pricing. We've done this now again at Faribault Woolen Mills. We tightened our margins. So we purposely lowered our profits because we believed that the demand curve was elastic, not inelastic. So if we lower our prices, people will buy more of it and we'll make it up on volume. We were told by our number one wholesale customer at the shoe company that we were committing suicide. We tripled the size of the business in the next nine years doing what, that. We took control of our own destiny. We stopped relying in this turmoil in the retailing business on retailers who had us pigeonholed as a black dress shoe company. We stopped relying on them to communicate who we were and what we stood for. Same thing is going on now at Faribault Woolen Mill. We're skating to where the puck is going by investing in e-commerce. Now, it's much obvious, more obvious today to invest in e-commerce than it was in 2008. <clears throat> and it was very unpopular, both with our own store managers in 2008 and also with our wholesale customers that we were going to get into our own e-commerce business. But we had to in order to expand the brand and what we mean and to communicate directly in a human way with our customers. All right. The last one is a point I, I like to make because I have this hard disk in my brain that's full of song lyrics, and it doesn't have to be high-quality stuff. It can be a commercial from 1973 or 1974. So Coca-Cola was right. What the world wants today is the real thing. It's the real thing. And if you keep the real thing, the real thing, you can grow a business out of trouble. And what's the real thing? It's what your customers want. It's what the people who work for you make and deliver to those customers. So I'll show you just some examples of this common sense strategy. If you were in the finance business, the legal profession, the accounting profession, and you saw these shoes, you'd say, oh yeah, I had bosses, partners, colleagues who wore those shoes their whole career. Men are replacement buyers. They like to get the same pair when the first pair wears out. We had discontinued these three shoes. Why? Because we knew we needed to expand our product category, our product offering, and we thought it would be inefficient to continue making, to make more shoes than we had made previously. That would be a, a burden on our cost structure. 
We've introduced over 100 new products at Faribault Woolen Mill in the last six months. At the shoe company, we tripled our style offering in two or three years in order to expand who we are and what we have to offer and thrill more customers. <coughs> These are the products that we just brought back out at Faribault Woolen Mills that were fan favorites. The product on the left was actually a beautiful photo from an advertising campaign. We had discontinued that product. We're, I was asked by one of our lead salespeople, what are we doing for holiday this year? I'm new to the company. I said, nothing. I don't know. And she said, we've got to have something for holiday. Well, we haven't developed anything. Well, let's go back to what was so popular in the past. So we've got these beautiful red and winter white plaids, holiday throws. The other thing that just really blew me away, we want to be a great blanket company, and we don't have the blanket that if you were to sit at home and draw a sketch of a blanket, you would put a satin edge on it, most likely. We weren't selling any satin edge blankets. We are now, as you can see, we're just introducing them. I'm very excited about those. Color. If you go to Italy and you look at a gelateria and you see 40 different flavors of gelato, it isn't just the flavors, it's the colors that you see and the way they're presented. Color is really beautiful. And people crave color because it's, it warms their hearts as well as their homes. All right, I don't have time for this story. Product development, you gotta invest in product development. That's the product development team at Allen Emmons when, after my first year there, and in the lower photo, it's sort of the product development team shortly after that. Now you notice that the four guys, in, except one, and he was just gone that day, they were all still on the team in the now category, but you notice how much lighter they look, how much lighter their hearts are, and I especially like the guy on the left, Noel, who thought that he had to conform to his idea of what our stodgy company was like. So he always wore long sleeve shirts, he always wore uh, his hair short. Well, in the lower picture, he gets to be himself. He was a graduate of the Milwaukee School of Design, a very creative guy. He's got his tattooed sleeve on his arm and his longer hair and a ponytail. You could tell he's a much happier guy. All right, I'm just gonna flip through a bunch of pictures of uh, product that we developed that the company would never have done in the past. Photography got to be a really important thing. You can't present color and beauty without having great photography. So we invested a lot in great photography. This is now what's going on at Allen Evans. I love artists and I love art. So we've partnered with some artists to come up with some new sofa throws for people's home decorating. Adam Terman is a local artist, he's a fantastic artist, and we've done these three by him. We've started to use maps because these are places where the heart is. That Lake Minnetonka map has been a fantastic new seller for us. These flags, the Norwegian flag, back to my initial comments, has been a top seller for us this summer. We want to have diversity in our artist. Uh, we've got uh, Tayo Onadean, who's a native Nigerian, lives in South Carolina now, who's done these beautiful prints for us that we're putting on blankets, the Sanborn Canoe Company. And then we're also getting into other products as well. We're wool experts. We know what good wool is, looks like and how it's done. So I think it's, uh, it's interesting, the Luther comment about the shoemaker, I had to do shoes, I went to the Good Shepherd Church my whole life, I guess I had to finish my career in wool. These are three things that we can do customized, and we're, we're doing all three of these to give money to a cause. So the one on the left is a blanket, it's got a quote from Martin Luther King on it, it said the time is always right to do what is right in that quote. And we've been selling this. We've raised $20,000 for the United Way Fund to rebuild at Chicago Avenue. We've also, uh, are, we're about to launch this blanket with Jack Nicholas. The Yellow Shirt Fund is the Children's Cancer Research Fund. We're gonna give $100 out of every blanket we sell to the Children's Miracle Network. And on the right, the one on the right is a tribute to the um, uh, Civilian Con Conservation Corps, and that one we will use to give to an environmental uh, group. 
So focusing on customers, bringing out a lot of product, keeping the real thing, the real thing, the main thing, it led to rapid growth in both these situations. The first, uh, the blanket company, it's just getting going, but we've had our first three profitable months. Each one was the first profitable month since, well, the, we've had three profitable months. They were the first profitable months in the last several years at the company in August, September, October. We're going to have a record year in sales down there in the new era since this, the mill was uh, shut down in 2009 and reopened in 2011. At Allen Edmonds, I had to stop this chart at 2013 because I, when we were sold in 2013, I wasn't able to uh, keep telling people about our financials. The new owners didn't like that. This is the uh, chart that I, I love the most. And I mentioned we're already above employment at the mill compared to before the layoffs last year. We built this uh, U.S employment at Allen Edmonds from just under 400, about 370 people, to over 700. And by the time we sold the company a second time in 2019, we were up near 1,000 people in U.S. jobs. All right, leadership's very powerful. The back to the idea that I think God is still talking to us. If you've never actually read The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, it's a fifth gospel for the holidays. It's great to see the play, but when you read it, you can go more slowly. You can reread some of the great lines that Dickens has in there. Fezziwig is often depicted as a, uh, as kind of a buffoon. He's like Tenardier in Les Miserables. But he's actually just, if you read the book, and it's a short book, if you read it, he's just a, a businessman who knows when to stop celebrate and appreciate his family. And Scrooge is watching this, and the ghost of Christmas past is egging him on about how what a fool Fezziwig must be, because he's not a miser, he's not totally focused on business. And Scrooge finally is starting to realize what he's become, and he says to the ghost of Christmas past, you don't understand. He had the power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our work a pleasure or a burden. That's what good leadership can be. I work at it all the time. I fail all the time. But I'm trying, and I think that's what my faith tells me I should be doing. I should be trying. So that's the end. And I took almost all our time. So that's I hope fine. nobody had a good question. <laughs> I've got some questions. Um, and at this point, if, and I should have mentioned, obviously, typically over the last 18 years of these events, they've obviously been live in person. Uh, Paul has, like our last two, or now three speakers, had to speak to an empty sanctuary. So um, thank you for joining us uh, again virtually. I, I want to make a few quick announcements, and then we do have a couple of questions for Paul to wrap the evening up. Um, First of all, I want to announce our next event. Uh, we'll take December and January off, and then our next event will be in early February, February 4th, uh, again, 7 o'clock, uh, that's 2021. It'll feature Joshua Straub, who is a um, family counselor. He's going to talk about faith and parenting, creating space for emotional intelligence. Uh, if you would like updates about our upcoming events, you can sign up for our email announcements at our website, uh, or you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram. I'll have another word about that in a second. I do want to pause, though, to say thank you to all of the sponsors who make these events possible. Um, from the start, 18 years ago, these events have not been a budget item of the churches that I've served, but have been sponsored or underwritten entirely by the generosity of individuals and local corporations. So let me just name uh, our corporate underwriters, uh, Crossroads Financial Group, Cressa, Ulrich Real Estate Group, Mally Design, Augio, Productivity Inc., Rapid Packaging, and Mastercraft Labels. Um, thanks to all of you who are our corporate underwriters. We also have a list uh, of all of our individual underwriters at the page on the Faith and Life website uh, for this particular event. And again, to each and every one of you who makes these events possible, I say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Tonight, I also want, I mentioned our, our social media. Um, Paul has gen very generously uh, is doing this talk uh, 
pro bono. Uh, and so he is not accepting an honorarium. We typically pay our speakers, uh, thus the need for underwriting. Uh, in lieu of an honorarium, we've actually purchased um, a number of throws from Faribault Woolen Mills, uh, which we've uh, embossed or, or embroidered with the Faith in Life logo. Uh, and those are going to be available through a random drawing. Uh, you can sign up for that drawing starting tomorrow at... 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's uh, tomorrow, November 6th. Uh, the, the, it will run through Monday, November 9th. It'll conclude at 9 a.m. We will announce the winner shortly after that. We'll have some photos. Paul mentioned the importance of photos. We'll have some photos of the throws on our Instagram and Facebook page. So please check those out. Uh, follow the instructions uh, to sign up for that uh, drawing, and we hope that uh, some of you out there will uh, be delighted when you receive those uh, in the next week or two. All right, we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to start, and I'm going to move back to my seat over here. Um, but the first one, Paul, I will, I'm going to go back to you started by talking about um, the heavy night, which I, and I know you mentioned the Packers. I assume you were speaking of something else going on. Uh, I want to go back to the beginning of your career. Uh, you started uh, at a bank in Chicago, but you actually began your career in Europe, I believe. And I'm wondering what that taught you about maybe seeing this country from overseas, if there were lessons you learned about um, the United States. It's, uh, it was fascinating. I, I learned a lot by looking through the eyes of Europeans at America. I would read the British press uh, more than the American press when I was over there. And as time went on, I would read the German press and understand uh, their perspectives on us. And at the time, there was a perspective uh, that uh, we had saved the world, their world. And I, I remember being uh, on a tour, and I asked Margot, my wife, and I were walking through a park, and there was some Dutch folks walking through the park. The park was in Italy. We were uh, uh, traveling in Italy, even though we lived in Germany. And this Dutch group was speaking English. And uh, we, we really wondered how people viewed Americans at that point. This was the, uh, the mid-'80s, 1984. Um, so uh, we asked them, because our experience was the countries in Europe were English they speak English better than we do, are the Netherlands and Scandinavian countries. And so they said, oh, where are you from? We're from America. And they said, we love Americans. And then another time I was, we were at the Trevi Fountain in Rome. And uh, somebody came by, and, and he was trying to sell us uh, a trinket of some kind. And he said, you're Americans, aren't you? I said, yeah. I said, we're not very popular right now. I can't remember what had just happened, but it was something that offended the rest of the world that our country had done. And he said, oh, that's, that's just a little thing. He said, there's a cemetery about 50 miles outside of our town. It's filled with hundreds of Americans who saved our country from fascism. So I, I, I learned what putting others ahead of yourself has meant for this country, that we did things that no other country would do. When I talk about it, we want to be a great American company, I, I think that means a couple of things. One, we should be accessible, democratic with a small d. We shouldn't have high luxury pricing for our products. They should be very high quality products, extremely well made, but accessible in their pricing. That's why we cut prices when we got there. It made in the USA, of course. Is, is another aspect of what we try to do. We, we think that it's incumbent on us as an American company, made in USA, to try to be what our country has been at its best, which is we do things other companies, other countries won't do. And that was the perspective of the Europeans about the US back then. I hope we can get back there. OK. Um... One questioner writes in and says, um, you are such a respected leader. Um, how has philanthropy and altruism helped to inform your le leadership style or vice versa? Your, I presume your own philanthropy is yes. what you're talking um, about. When David Crosby said to me, if you, you, if you can afford to be gracious, you should be, he was really talking about philanthropy at the time. And, 
And uh, another friend of mine said, I think it was another uh, gospel type saying that I remember, there are no luggage racks on the hearse, which is another way of saying you can't take it with you. So uh, we've been so lucky, so lucky, and, and I love to share that, not wait till I'm gone and pass it on in a will, but actually try to share that as much as, as we can during these times of such great need. So um, it's informed who I am, and I've always felt paying it forward like that actually came back to, uh, to our benefit anyway. So it's, it's a great symbiotic thing when you're philanthropic. Um, just to telegraph to folks, by the way, we've got about, let's see, I'm guessing uh, two, three, four questions or so. Um, and historically, these events have always gone till about 8.15, um, so we'll see how we do here. But um, the next question from a listener, uh, you mentioned getting more into e-commerce in 2008. Uh, were you selling online prior to that, or were you not doing direct customer sales at that time? We had about a two million dollar business selling online at that point. Uh, just a few years later, it was tens of millions of dollars. We we were we had our toe in the water at that time, but we were not really um, featuring it at all. Okay, and another. Um, this is a, a kind of specific question. Um, I own a company in Mound. We manufacture compostable and recyclable packaging for food service. Do you ever see a time when uh, corporate America will be required to buy a percentage of produced locally or made in USA so we can compete with China? No, I don't know if we'll ever have regulations like that. Uh, the government does when it comes to buying for the military. We make blankets and have since before World War I for the military, all the branches except, I think, the Coast Guard, uh, sleep under our, our blankets. West Point, before World War I, began buying blankets from us. They still do, and that's heavily based on the idea that the military needs to buy American-sourced product if they can. Um, but will there be regulations that require other companies to do that? I, I don't think we'll get there with regulation. I hope we can get there with tax policy someday. Um, I think we should. Other countries have great industrial policies that favor their, their businesses. Businesses are a force for good. You listen to a lot of politicians and you would think that businesses are, are bad people doing bad things. It's just not the case. Mm -hmm. So we want to build our businesses. They, they still employ 80% of the people who work in this country. Um, a, um, I don't know if this individual knows you or not. Uh, his name Probably. is Dwayne. Uh, he doesn't give his last name, but he says, Paul, what role did your father play in your faith and leadership development? So, uh, my dad was very involved with the Lutheran Church, and my mother taught Sunday school, third grade Sunday school, for, I don't know, 15 years at the late service, but we went to the early service, so I never had my mom for Sunday school. But uh, we had a minister at our church. His name is Wilfred Bockelman. What a great name. He, he worked for uh, Lutheran missionary services, but he would preach every now and then at our church. My father thought very highly of him, very intelligent man. And I remember when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, he stood up in front, and part of the reason I remember is he's the first person I ever heard speak who stuttered. Hmm. And he would uh, say these profound things, but he would fight to get them out. And it, it was... Uh, it was very effective, actually, because you'd be on the edge of your chair wondering what was coming. Very smart man. And he said, let's face it. We believe in God because our parents taught us to. But now what do we do with it? Back to this idea that doubt is, is not a good excuse. So uh, my parents had every, every impact on my faith development. OK. Um I, I have a whole lot of other questions I could ask you. I think what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to, and we could talk all night, um, but I, I think I'm going to end with, unless someone else sends in a different question uh, on top of this, um, I think I'm going to end with this one, uh, which is another question from a listener. It's a slightly longer one, but that's okay. Um, it brings us back maybe to your 
uh, you mentioned... No, long-winded people really bother me. So <laughs> do what you can. You're, good, you're, you're being a good shepherd church and the fact that you're now trading in wool. Uh, so this, I'll, I'll just read the question. It says, uh, my question is about sheep and not the ones that contribute to those great Faribo Mills wool blankets. And then he says, first, full disclosure, I'm not a Lutheran, I'm a Catholic. And to you, questioner, I would just say, uh, I mentioned that Paul is one of the few Lutheran speakers we've had in this series. The, action, the, the truth is, if you look back at our list of speakers, the majority of them, believe it or not, have been Catholic. I'm not sure quite how that happened, but it did. Um, anyway, I, going back to his question, I only say that because we all need to know that it does not matter. Everyone gathered tonight, there or online, are people of faith, and that is most important. Also, I'm sitting down here in warm Florida, so that is probably strike two against me. Well, being a Catholic isn't strike one, first of all, and I'm delighted that you're with us from Florida, so thank you for joining us. Um, he goes on, in reading Luke's Gospel this morning, we hear the parable of the, of the sheep, um, which reminds me of Paul Grangard. I'm assuming this gentleman, or I, it's a gentleman, I assume, knows you again. Um, this reminds me of Paul Grangard, a business encounter that turned into a rare close friendship. What makes Paul a rare investment banker but a great ambassador for all Lutherans is that Paul's priority as a CEO is not the bottom line, it is the sheep. And if the one sheep is missing, nothing is more important to Paul than that one sheep. I promise you that is how his employees at his companies have felt. So my question is about sheep. Paul is a man of deep faith. What is your process or how do you balance the importance of the sheep in your leadership roles and responsibilities? And his final line is, and thank you for the Notre Dame shout out in your opening, strike three against me. And again, it's not strike three against you because it turns out that the guy reading your question has a graduate degree from Notre Dame. And in fact, we just celebrated the 23rd birthday of our first son who was born on a Notre Dame game day. So anyway, do you remember the question though, Paul? And that was a lovely uh, um, encomium for you. But uh, as a man of deep faith, what is your process or how do you balance oh. the importance of sheep yes. in your leadership roles? Uh, first of all, I'll point out that there was only one church when that mosaic went up on the wall, that was not a Catholic thing. That was the history of the entire church. I had a chance to see John Paul II give his first mass mm. on St. Stanis, uh, was it St. Wenceslaus Day mm -hmm. in, uh, when I was in college. He had just been made Pope shortly before I went over. And there were nuns from Poland crying all around me. It was one of the most faith edifying, beautiful things I'd ever been a part of. You know, we talk all the time in the Lutheran faith about selling of indulgences. Well, I don't know what, it was really state in those days. It wasn't religion, it was a state and the money was coming down to build St. Peter's. And I'm glad they did, <laughs> to be honest. It's a, Amazing, amazing place. So it, is, it, it isn't about that, but you know, I think a lot about the differences among denominations and how they've completely been watered down. Nobody really remembers what the Hundred Years' War was fought about, the differences in communion understandings in those days. So he doesn't have any strikes against him. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I would say you know, when I was a kid, a new Bible came out to try to make it more accessible to to the baby boom called The Way. And uh, I've always tried to think of another way. So we had to shut down a plant when I first got to Allen Edmonds. The best practices would have been to go in and rip off the Band-Aid, let everybody go, shut down the plant, and uh, get it over with, and then try to move on. We ended up spending six months because the plant had been sold to Allen Edmonds 10 years before by a man who who had had that plant in his family for two generations. And he was still working for us. And I asked him, does he want it back? And I created a very small competitor when we did that. Uh, and my board went along with it. So we took another way out. Mm. We kept those jobs. We kept that plant. He's still in business today. You should buy shoes from him. It's called Rancourt, R-A-N-C-O-U-R-T and company in Littleton, Maine. And, uh, you know, I think when you're challenged with business troubles, you need to let somebody go. It's, it's not about the decision so much as how you do it. 
So uh, David Crosby, again, was under pressure to fire somebody in our department. And he said, just, he got very frustrated. I was in a meeting. He said, would you let me handle it? I know how to make these problems go away. And the person ended up leaving us with great dignity and, uh, and um, you know, he thought it was his decision to go after being coached that maybe this wasn't a great fit for him. I learned a lot from David in that regard. It, uh, I've done the same thing over the years. All right. Um, I want to say, Paul, thank you for being with us tonight. I, uh, we're going to attempt to s continue our social distancing, and we did m wear masks before we began this, but I'm going to give you um, what we give all of our speakers, which is a granite plaque, um, which says, with thanks to Paul Grandgard for bringing faith to life. If this room were filled with people, you would be hearing wild applause now, but I'll hand you that. And, uh, a sigh of relief, I think, is what I'd be hearing. But thank you. No, no. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Yeah. To all of you, where am I looking now? Um, up there again. All right. Um, to all of you, thank you again for being with us uh, this evening. We're glad you joined us. We look forward to seeing you in February. And until then, be well, stay safe, and God bless. Thank you. <laughs>